Zip Recruiters has come on board as a proud sponsor of Without Warning Podcast. Use code WOWWOW and search for jobs anytime, anywhere. Let's support the sponsors that support Without Warning. Warning. The following episode contains details about sexual violence and elements that are graphic in nature. My daughter had just been hanging out with them and Aaron Lilly didn't come to the funeral. No one came to the funeral. That didn't make sense to me. The Lauren Agee case was hastily closed by authorities, but many questions remain. Come behind the curtain with private investigator Sheila Waisaki as she uncovers the truth about what happened to Lauren. This is Without Warning. No one would choose a job like this to investigate murders of of children or a murder in general. That is a job that chooses you. And I have tried to stop doing it several times, but um, I keep being pulled in because of the desperation of these families. And I understand what these families have gone through because of my roommate, because I went through the process. And I know what they tell families, um, what they don't tell families, and the process of getting someone to listen or care. I related to Sherry Smith. I relate to every one of my clients and people that call me and they just want to be heard and they want someone to care about their case, about their child or, um, you know, that they have a loss and no one's listening. When Lauren came into a room, everybody took notice. The child demanded an audience. She was vivacious very loud, (laughs) but very funny, and just loved other people. This is Sherry Smith, Lauren's mother. What was important to Lauren changed from, you know, when she was little till the time she was in high school. When she was little, she was very family-oriented as far as, um, you know, she did everything with Mike and I, and we traveled and family vacations, and then she played all the sports where Mike and I were the coaches or the team mom or the room mom, or, you know, we were always involved in her life. Um, so she liked activity. When she was in high school, she was more um, goal-oriented and peer-oriented. She really liked having friends. And she liked being involved in every kind of social activity, whether it was dances, whether it was uh, fundraisers, whether it was uh, uh, raising money for the Humane Society. Lauren wanted to be somehow involved in uh, CSI work. She had contemplated becoming an, an attorney. And then we talked about her maybe working for the FBI And then she also said she wanted to solve mysteries and crimes. So together we spent a lot of time watching, you know, the CSI programs and Law and Order and other police-oriented television. During the summer of 2015, uh, Lauren was, uh, you know, getting ready to start back to school In fact, we had just registered for classes at Ball State, and she was so excited because she was starting all the CSI classes. And so that's all she could talk about. The case was closed without a proper investigation. They made their decision within 10 minutes of getting there. They did not investigate 48 hours after talking to some people without the medical report, without the autopsy, without anything. They're already dictating what happened. So the listeners are going to hear a lot of rumors and misinformation. So they're going to have to decipher what's true and what's not. We don't have all the answers, but we take every single lead in a case and we track it down to make sure it's not true or it's true including the rumors. We're going through the investigation as I went through the investigation, not knowing the players, not understanding what happened, 
I mean, just going in blind. Let me guess, you heard we burned down the campsite? Yeah. Yeah, that's a rumor. I, so. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I know. Like I said. That's my favorite rumor. Of we the want to like, close this case. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to close if people don't cooperate. I it's know. just not. I know. People are horrible. You know, I heard so much all the way down to the point that, that, that people were saying they heard that I for sure did it. They actually, and this is the funny part, said that you said that I tied her up with ropes and dragged her on the campsite so the evidence would be gone. Like, people are crazy. Those are Lauren's friends who were with her at Wakefest the night she died. The following audio is between Jeremy Taylor and... Aaron Lilly. Jeremy Taylor is the DeKalb County investigator in charge of Lauren's case. Aaron Lilly was one of the campers. Uh, yeah, dude, I heard LD was like, uh, said that Lauren had like jumped off the cliff and got like a concussion or something. I'm like, well, where did this come from? When was that kid ever there other than when I kicked him out? Everyone's here say, uh, back when I was in school, I remember we used to you know, like 12 people in a circle. The teacher would like give you a note, and you take that note, and you read it real quick, and you crumble it up, and you go, tell it to this person. By the time it gets all the way around 12 people, it's like the none of it is the story that you just read on that paper. It's just unbelievable, man. Someone asked me what Wakefest was. I'd tell them it was one of the coolest most fun wakeboarding competitions in the southeast almost 2,000 people or more show up for a friday to sunday tournament on the water at center hill lake you get to spend time in the water with friends and family drinking cold ones and watching some of the world's craziest wakeboarders fling themselves high in the sky doing flips and spins it's a great time to see other people spend time on your boat with your family it's just an overall unreal weekend that you look forward to every single year. Wakefest is in Smithville, Tennessee, which is about two hours away from Hendersonville, Tennessee, which is where Lauren Agee lived. And Hannah Palmer and Lauren Agee drove to Wakefest. Hannah Palmer was driving Lauren's car to Wakefest. Lauren and Hannah Palmer went to Wakefest July 24th, 2015, which was a Friday. And then on Saturday, which was July 25th, 2015, they spent the day out at Wakefest and the evening um, at Fish Lips. On Sunday, which was July 26th, 2015, was when Lauren's body was found around 4.30 p.m. From the time I went to sleep to the time I went away, there's nothing. It's just a void of what, what was she doing? What was she thinking? Was she yelling for me? You know, was she peeing? Was she with somebody else? Were, you know, I don't know. Chris Yarchuk was an off-duty White County police officer, head of security for Wakefest. Hannah Palmer and Chris Yarchuk were on a pontoon boat when Chris Yarchuk turned on his cell phone recorder. You will hear the actual tape of Chris Yarchuk and Hannah Palmer the moment they are finding Lauren's body. Did you guys go to a houseboat after, or go to the, walk the dock, or do anything after you left the bar? Yeah, when we left the bar, when you last saw her, we walked yeah. all the way down, got in the canoe, and went up there. Okay. And she was fine when we went. I'm just yeah. I know she probably went to pee, but she didn't have her shoes. She didn't have her keys, wallet, or phone. And she, like, would not leave without that stuff, you know? Yeah. Like, I know, I've known her since I was 10. Like, yeah. I know she wouldn't leave without that. Okay. This episode is brought to you by Home Advisor. Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where Home Advisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project. 
the first time I saw Lauren was Friday night at uh, Fish Lips, the marina bar. Yeah. This is Evan Shelton and Michael Sands speaking. Michael Sands was the first private investigator that Sherry Smith got in contact with about Lauren's case. Evan Shelton's a third party with nothing to gain. He is the one who can tell the truth without losing anything. And he knows Lauren. He's known Lauren for a while. He knows how she behaves, what her attitude is, how she reacts to things. And he saw her when she left. He's hugely important. I think those first accounts, the firsthand accounts are very important. And uh, then I saw, uh, let's see, I saw them again Saturday night at Fish Lips. And I hadn't seen them during the day up until that point. I saw them Saturday night and uh, we're just, you know, at the marina having a good time, dancing around, you know, yeah, just having a good time. And then we all left and... Uh, I guess the la the next time I seen either one of them two, either one of Hannah or Lauren, was in the mor Sunday morning. Me and my cousin Clint, we were getting ice from the from like the marina dock, not the yeah. fish lips bar, but the uh, the marina the over there. Floating dock over there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we we're getting ice, and whenever we were on the way back to our boat, we passed by uh, Hannah's boat, whoever she was with. I guess all the people that they were with, but she asked me. And Clint, if we had seen Lauren any, you know, that night after she had left, fish lips or, uh, it's a tear. <laughs> or uh, if we had seen her that morning, and, you know, we both said, no, we haven't seen her. And she said, well, we haven't been able to find her this morning. So if y'all, you know, hear from her, just let us know. And you familiar with uh, Chris Stout? You know him? Chris Stout. Chris Stout. No, I have no idea who he is. You know, Aaron Lilly? No idea. Uh, Hannah Palmer? I know her. Okay. Do you recall what color shorts she was wearing? I am colorblind, but <laughs> <laughs> but I do. I would say I'm about 95% sure that she had on some white, at, at least extremely bright, like whitish colored shorts. Can you start um, what Lauren's condition was leaving the bar that Saturday night? Uh, she had had a few beers, but she was, in my opinion, not drunk. Okay. She, you know, of course, had, had a few, but she was definitely not publicly intoxicated. Not impaired? Yes. Okay. The boys are Aaron Lilly, Chris Stout, and Brick Scambrell. The camp was set up by Brick Scambrell and Aaron Lilly before Lauren and Hannah Palmer got there. The camp was on top of a cliff, which is federal land, at Pates Ford Marina. There was a video of Lauren, Hannah Palmer, and Samantha Arnold on a canoe going over to the cliff. In the video, you hear, we're going into a death trap. I find it interesting that's where Lauren died. My perception of that video is Lauren is seeing the cliff for the first time going over in the dark to the cliff. Hannah Palmer describes it as a death trap, and she's exactly right. Jacob texted Jay and was like, Aaron's leaving Hank at, We're in a at canoe. the house for the weekend. Oh, James, I'm like, like, dude, why are you leaving Hank there and no one there? I'm like, I can see what I'm seeing right now. Yeah. You can't. We're going into a death trap. Yeah, look, it's a cliff on both sides. It's a cliff on both sides, so we're literally staying. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Here's the biggest thing about that campsite, and this is talked about when I interviewed Hannah in Florida. When I asked her when she thought about Lauren being gone, she noticed her purse, her phone, and her shoes. When she went down to the bottom of the cliff that morning, I asked her, was the canoe still there? That's when she hesitated. Hey, 
And so when you woke up and her stuff was there and then at the bottom of the cliff, was the canoe still there? Mm -hmm. It was still there. Evan was the last person to see Lauren alive. I asked Lauren where she was staying at and she kind of pointed outside of fish lips and said, you see those lights up there on the side of the cliff? That's where our cabin is. And she kept on saying cabin, cabin, cabin. So whenever I heard that they were sleeping in enus or mm -hmm. whatever they're called, yeah. I was like, well, I thought you were sleeping in a cabin. In an investigation, you have to go through every rumor. You have to decipher which one's true, which one's not. It's important to try to filter out. So you go through, you find out which one's a rumor, you move on to the next step, and you take each individual rumor or information that comes your way and you follow it, no matter where it leads you. Because it has been amazing in this case which ones have turned out to be shocking to me. Because, I, I mean, this case is so... Uh, there are so many twists and turns and you think you have it figured out and then something else comes your way and you're like, I didn't see that coming. The listeners are smart enough to figure out um, what's right and what's wrong and who's telling the truth and who isn't. You don't need to stick to the story or keep the story. It's the truth. All you have to do is tell the truth. Hey, sorry that I keep bothering you. Oh, no. No, you're not bothering me. I just, I've been slammed today. I've had some stuff come up. This is Ryan Melanson, who was the off-duty police officer that was at Wakefest the entire weekend, who was immediately at the scene after they found Lauren's body. Um, I was a patrol sergeant at the Wake County Sheriff's Department at the time. And when you were on you know, July, in July at Wakefest, what, why were you at Wakefest? I was working a security detail for Fish Lips Marina, uh, providing security. Fish Lips is a, a floating bar. The bar is, uh, it's floating out on the lake. Uh, they serve alcohol and it's a restaurant flash bar. They serve food and alcohol. Uh, fishermen, came rolling up to the dock on a, a fisher fish boat and uh he told us that there was a body floating in the water that he thought was a child, a small child. And it was at that time that myself and Yardchuck got on a uh another boat, a pontoon boat, and followed the fisherman's boat out to where he thought he saw the body and that's when we discovered her body. And can you describe the scene when you arrived? Yeah, um, she was floating face down in the water when we got out there, and it turned out it wasn't a child. You know, it was the body of Lauren Agee. And uh, at that time, we didn't we didn't disturb the body or anything like that. We got the local investigating jurisdiction involved in the TWRA, and um, we just assisted with their investigation from that point on. And um, and it was at that time that Aaron Lilly. And Chris Stout came toward us on a, uh, a canoe boat and were asking if that was their friend in the water. I yelled at them from the patrol boat to stay back. And they continued coming toward us. And um, they were asking, is that our friend? We're missing our friend. Is that our friend in the water? And when they said that, I had them approach my boat that I was on for further questioning, obviously, because there was a body in the water. I mean, obviously, they had something to do with it. They didn't know something about it, you know. When they were asking if that was their friend in the water, right off the bat, that was a major red flag to me because, obviously, they they knew something, and they hadn't reported anything. So, in my mind, a couple of things could be going on here. Either they had something to do with her death, and they started freaking out because they thought the body wasn't going to surface, and it did. And they figure they better start, you know, backpedaling and act like they knew she was missing and they're looking for her. Or, um, you know, they just panicked and they didn't know what else to do. So 
instead of trying to hide from us, they figured they'd come forward and try to, you know, act like they were innocent right from the get-go. Their body language was, was like, slightly robotic. Um, they were scared to death. They weren't relaxed at all. Um, and it wasn't a concern kind of robotic movement they had going on. It was uh, their minds were, were racing and their hearts were pounding and they were just freaked out because I think it was a surprise to them that the body was actually found. I don't think they planned on that. So they were they were really stressed out to the max. And then when they were asking if it was their friend and everything, which they already knew was their friend, when when we told them what we had in the water after we had, we had them describe what she looked like to us first, and then we confirmed that, um, well, this body floating in the water, yeah, it kind of matches that description. They weren't surprised. They already knew it. It was no, no shock to them. And um, there was really no remorse. Um, it was an employee from the marina, which Harry. I don't remember his name. Harry. Harry. And then it was Chris and Aaron and myself. We're all sitting down on the boat, floating around. The TWRA and the investigating law enforcement agency is at the, the crime scene investigating the crime and everything at this point. And um, uh, at this point, one of the investigators from that jurisdiction wanted Aaron and Chris to come to the campsite. And they wanted to talk to him at the campsite for a minute. So we got on, we were still on the boat at this point. We, we went out to the island where the campsite was at, that, that ledge there. And um, and Aaron went up with the investigator, and that's when Aaron came back down with um, he came back down off the cliff with a totally different look at everything, a totally different mindset on everything because he knew when that investigator was up there processing what was a crime scene and treating it like it wasn't. Uh, I think Aaron his life kind of came back to him a little bit at that point because he realized that there's no way these guys are going to figure out anything that happened here just based on what that investigator showed him. They actually, Aaron was acting like he was falling asleep on the boat. Chris was all jittery, like, you know, he acted like he was high. The kid was just wigging out pretty bad. And every time he went to talk, it didn't matter what it was about. It didn't even have anything to do with pertaining to, to Lauren. Aaron would tell him to shut up. He didn't want to talk about nothing. Just shut up, he kept telling him. Because mm-hmm. I started talking to uh, to Chris about, so what do you do for a living anyway? You know, what, what do you do for a job? You got a job? And that's when he'd tell me, you know, yeah, I dispose of human body parts and everything. And I'm like, well, human body parts? He's like, yeah, you know, all the amputees and stuff that comes from the hospitals. And I'm like, ah, you know, it sounds like a gruesome job. And then I got him talking about stuff and then when it started to get a little bit too deep or something, Aaron would just butt in there and tell him to shut up. And that's when Chris was just kind of in a day staring at my side arm as I was sitting across from him on the boat. And he just kind of like went into zombie mode, just staring at it. I couldn't tell what he was thinking. So I just asked him. I'm like, what are you thinking over there, man? He's like, well, I'm just thinking about how I can get that gun off your head and get off this boat. I'm like, buddy... If you try to go for my gun, it's not going to work out the way you think it's going to. And uh, I said it jokingly because, you know, I realized he said it kind of jokingly, too. And then about 10 minutes later, he said the exact same thing again. And that's when um, that's when the guy that was operating the boat told um, Chris, he's like, you know, you better just keep your mouth shut and sit right where you're at. He's like, if you try to go for that officer's gun, it's something bad going to go wrong for you. And then Chris chilled out a little bit and just, they both sat there from that point and just waited the time out until we, uh, we came into the shore. The two fishermen that came upon Lauren's body were father and son. Dylan and Lynn found Lauren's body around 4.30, about 600 feet as the crow flies below the cliff in Second Cove. The written statement wasn't taken until after 7, about 7.10, 7.15. 
When I was investigating, I was told by law enforcement that the kids went to the police station, filled out the paperwork, and left. They didn't wait to be interviewed by the police. They were told to be interviewed, but they did not wait around. So when the three kids came back from giving their written statement, they came to the cliff and there was no crime scene tape blocking them. So they could freely go up to the cliff and freely leave. So originally there was crime scene tape in the pictures, the original pictures taken by the police officer where you see Hannah and Aaron. And then later there was no crime scene tape blocking the area from the cliff. And so the kids can go freely back and forth. So normally in an investigation, you'll have an area that's blocked off until the investigators can go and do a thorough job. You don't let people back up where there has been some sort of accident, crime scene, investigations have to be done first. The whole point of crime tape is to keep people away from contaminating the area. They went back up to the cliff to retrieve their stuff, the tents, their tarps, their clothes. When Sherry was given the items back that Lauren had packed, things were missing like her sleeping bag and clothing. So who took them? When you get to know Sherry, you absolutely get to know Lauren. There's such a determination between Sherry that I think Lauren had. This is Sherry Smith, Lauren's mother. So when Lauren didn't come home on Saturday, uh, Michael and I were very worried, but she's almost 22 years old and... We were thinking, okay, well, maybe she has decided to go see Chase or she maybe stayed an extra day at this Wakefest event. But we were still worried. And Saturday night I was blowing up her phone and she was not responding. So, of course, my mommy sense went up and I started thinking, okay, you know, surely one of her friends, if there was something wrong, would reach out to me. Well, Sunday morning I got up. Still hadn't heard from her. I went to work showing property. And by the end of the day, I was in full-blown panic mode because I could not reach her on the phone and I didn't know what was going on. I was actually preparing to get in my car and drive there and see if I could find her. I had reached out to Chase, her boyfriend. He hadn't heard from her either. Uh, The phone number I had for Hannah was not working. Nobody was answering it. So I really was starting to get very concerned. Michael and I came home and uh, we were um, alarmed when a police officer came to our front door and said, uh, are you Lauren Taylor Agee's parents? Uh, There's been an accident in DeKalb County and you need to come to the hospital as soon as possible. Now being a parent, your mind goes all different directions and you think, Okay, please, God, if she's been in an accident, you know, let her be, you know, okay, she's in the hospital, you know, maybe, you know, it's all going to be all right. But we got in the car, we drove like crazy people as fast as we could, got to the hospital, and they made me sit in the emergency room or whatever that room was for 15 to 20 minutes while I kept asking the lady behind the counter, can you please tell me something about my daughter? And she said, ma'am, you're just going to have to wait. So we waited. We waited. And then Jeremy Taylor from DeKalb County Sheriff's Department, he walks in and he says to us, come with me. And we went into a private room and he said, I need to tell you that your daughter didn't make it. She's dead. Every mother's worst nightmare (laughs) is to hear something like that about your child. I had to learn about Lauren's death from a deputy sheriff at the hospital. Lauren had been with these people, supposedly with these people, Friday night and Saturday 
And then I hear about it Sunday night that she was missing. Why? What? Who does that? So when I was told that her injuries were possibly from cliff jumping, in fact, we were told that at the hospital. Jeremy Taylor said, from what I understand, your daughter was cliff jumping and she was knocked unconscious for a few seconds and had injuries. In fact, that she, they were uh, quite extensive injuries. And we think that maybe in the middle of the night, because of these injuries, that she had uh, suffered a concussion or, or something and that caused her to fall off the cliff. So that was from the hospital we were being told that, that she had been cliff jumping. So me knowing my child inside and out, I'm like, maybe, but not likely. Okay. And then at, during the week, I'm asking people for videos or pictures or anything. And what I found very perplexing was there's no pictures on anybody's phone of this cliff jumping event. Sherry and Michael Smith were told that Lauren was cliff jumping. Now, there are no written statements. There's no record of that. I don't know where Jeremy got that information, but he had it before he went to the hospital. And there's no police report with that information on there. My daughter had just been hanging out with them and Aaron Lilly didn't come to the funeral. No one came to the funeral. That didn't make sense to me. So I questioned that. And so when I started questioning the kids or the friends of the kids, then they started, oh, you know, you need to get over it. You need to move on with your life. You need to. Then I started going, oh, wait a minute. This is not normal behavior. So when I got that phone call Sunday from Ryan Mendelson, and he said, Miss Smith, we need to talk because there's so much I need to tell you. After that day, I knew. I knew I needed to ask more questions. Lauren's family gives their full permission for any and all details to be shared in hope that the truth will come out. If you know anything at all, call 1-888-599-0008 or email tips at SheilaWysocki.com. This season on Without Mourning. Who did? Hannah. She started following me to my car, and she grabbed me by my hair and ripped me down to the concrete. She fought you? Yeah, like literally 10 people saw her do it. Well, we've asked you a lot of questions. You got any for us? Not really, but I want to ask. Like, I just want to make sure all this stuff is figured out. You know? and it almost seems like I'm a suspect right now, you know, but I know you guys are just doing your job. You know what? No one knows exactly where she was, but, I mean, they said that they found a rock of blood on it, is what James told me. Lauren was with the Christopher Stout guy at Wakefest? Yes, like, the whole time. And I know that she, like, slept in the hammock with him. And I said, so you so you mean to tell me if I witness something out here in White County right now, that I'm supposed to wait for you to come and ask me about it? Is that what you're saying? You have an obligation to now, not only as a person, but as a law enforcement officer, when you suspect something is wrong, you have to tell it. We have an obligation. We take an oath. We can't believe us yet. Without warning, host and executive director and executive producer, Sheila Waisaki. Producers, Katie Zitzman and Aaron Parker. Editors, Mark Lambert, Katie Zitzman and Aaron Parker. Audio engineer and original music by Mark Lambert. Narrator, Tim Evans. Mixing and mastering by Resonate Recordings. 
If you or someone you know knows something about this case or the people involved, you can submit tips by emailing tips at chilawaisaki.com or call toll-free 888-599-0008.